Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode here from Gwiglets, the YouTube channel dedicated to all things books, beards and beyond. Thank you as always for your views, your subscribing and all the comments and the wonderful feedback I receive. Today we're looking at Macbeth Act 4 scenes 2 and 3 as a double bill today in today's video. So as always, give this video a thumbs up, make sure to share it with all your friends, hit the notifications and the bell icons for more updates. And we're across Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok as well. So feel free to follow Quiglet across all the different social media platforms. Now, what you can do with this particular lesson, as always, make sure you're taking notes, make sure you're annotating your copy of the text along to this. It's a really important point there. Use it as a revision tool, alone or with classmates. Use it as mind map as well, a way to help build mind maps and really engage that knowledge. And as well, make sure you list examples as well that you notice from the clip. So today we're looking at Act 4, Scenes 2 and 3. Some key information you need to know before we start the video. First of all, Macbeth has sent murderers to Fife, as we know, which is where Macduff's castle is, in order to wipe out the Macduffs. The Macduffs, um, meanwhile, with uh, our, while that's happening, Macduff is persuading Malcolm to return to Scotland to overthrow Macbeth as king. Macduff learns that his family have been killed and as a result, he swears to personally kill Macbeth in Act 4, Scene 3. So that's a very short version. We're going to be really immersive in this today and we'll give you a lot more detail starting now. So we begin at Fife, Macduff's castle. It is Lady Macduff, her son and Ross. Now Macduff is still in England. Obviously his family are defenceless here. This kind of adds to the very cruelty of the scene. Macbeth goes from murdering a king, which is evil in itself, but a man. Even before that, he's murdering other soldiers. He's killing other soldiers, but in the name of the king. He then goes on to kill Banquo, another adult male. But then he's going on to people here who are defenceless uh, victims. And really showing the level of evil by which he is committing. Lady Macduff begins by saying, what, hath he, what had he done to make him fly the land? There's a sense of confusion. Macduff, Macduff has rushed off here. And in doing so, he has left his family, his defenceless family, all alone, uh, leaving her to be very confused. She then continues and says, He had none. Macduff had no patience. His flight was madness. Our fears do make us traitors. Notice how she feels betrayed by Macduff here. She's very heavily critical of him. While he's the character that ultimately will slay Macbeth, at this particular point, he is a character that is very much criticised by those that love him the most, which I think is a very poignant and telling thing to notice in this scene. As we continue, notice how Lady Macduff continues this, arguing that was it wisdom to leave his wife, to leave his babes? He loves us not. She feels that her husband, Macduff, who will become a hero of sorts at the end of the play, has betrayed their family, has betrayed his family, uh, with a very substantial cost as a result. Poor Wren, the most diminutive of birds, will fight her young ones in her nest against the owl. All is the fear and nothing is the love. Note she compares herself here to a Wren. This bird imagery is used to reinforce her helplessness and the feeling of doom that's coming across here at what has happened. As the scene continues, Ross argues to, that her husband is actually noble, wise and judicious. He's defending Macduff's honours and virtues in spite of what he has done. Cruel at the times when we are traitors and do not know ourselves. He says that Macduff doesn't realise what he has done to his family, that in a, a rash quick action as he's just committed, he has instead um, cost his family. Continuing forward, Macduff, Lady Macduff then comments on how her son is fathered, and yet he's fatherless. Going really quite deep here and saying how um, Macduff's son has no father figure now. Um, as a result of what he has done to his children and family. Ross then exits at this point and leaves Lady Macduff and the son alone. What we see here is Lady Macduff then commenting how your father's dead, you know, almost dead to them in a, in a figurative manner. And he, she asks, what will you do now? How will you live? The son says, as birds do. Uh, they are discussing their life without Macduff and there's a lot of light-hearted wordplay going on in the following lines saying how he'll carry on anyway with what I get, I mean, and so do they, just like a you know, a bird without its, its mother bird there. Um, the son's words are kind of dismissive of Lady Macduff's fears, but also show his kind of naivety and how he's just a young child, which kind of reinforces the actual tragedy and the severity of what is going to happen soon. As a result, uh, Lady, the son asks if his father was a traitor, and she confirms this. She, this is a continued discussion between them. 
and why Macduff is a traitor. And we get this continued sense of wordplay further down and this idea of traitors and there's more traitors than good people. Um, so he wouldn't die for that. Uh, the son says the liars and swearers are fools for there there are liars and swearers enough to beat the honest men and hang up them. If he were dead, you'd weep for him. If you had not, it were a good sign that I should quickly have a new father. So the son's light-hearted pro approach to this kind of um, adds, adds an element of sadness to what is about to happen. The son doesn't realise just how um, deep the sheer gravity of what is taking place here. It was an important point to mention. The, and an anonymous messenger then enters and, and bids her, while he is not you know, be not found here. He's pleading for her to leave and how she's in grave danger at this point. Heaven preserve you, I dare abide no longer is a really telling point here, that she's really in a sense of doom. Lady Macduff then says, where should I fly? Um, and I have done no harm. That she she realises she hasn't done anything wrong, why should I leave? That she remembers now that I'm in this earthly world where to do harm is often laudable and to do good sometime accounted dangerous folly. It's kind of a comment on what the witches say at the very beginning of this play, you know, that the good will be defeated or perish and evil will rise as a result. Very telling points here from Lady Macduff, realising that, you know, why should she, but being a good person in this evil world will lead to her doom and this sadness that comes with it. We then see the murderers emerge. And Lady, Macbeth, Lady Macduff says, what are these faces? It's kind of in a very interesting parallel here to this kind of supernatural aspect of the play. These faces, it makes them sound almost spectral and ghostly. The language here mirrors that of Banquo in Act 1, Scene 3, when he first sees the witches. So there's almost this fear that's seen in the murderers from Lady Macduff. They comment, where is your husband? She says, I hope in no, no place so unsanctified where such as thou mayst find him. There's a comment on this evil intention of the murderers at this point and how um, they come from a hell-like place and she wishes her husband was not there and hopes sincerely he isn't. First murderer comments how he's a traitor and the son says, Thou liest, thou shag-haired villain. He says, What you egg and stabs him, murdering him. Notice he's referred to as an egg. It's kind of a reference to his youth there, how he's just a young person. And this murderer is willing to kill a child in front of his own mother. Uh, the son then dies and then Lady Macduff leaves the scene crying with the murderers following her. The brutality of the scene is really starkly seen. The child dies on stage which reinforces just this savagery of not just the murderers but Macbeth's orders as after all they, he was the one that ordered the murderers to be there. Lady Macduff is murdered off stage in a similar manner to Duncan and again showing the cruelty of what is taking place here and just how vulnerable and alone and defenseless the Macduffs were. So before we go on to the new next scene, I have what is a new feature in our channel called the Quick Quick Quiz. I'd like you to undertake this Quick Quick Quiz. Have a go, there are three questions and if you leave them as a comment below, I'll reply with a mark as a comment myself. So they're all based on what I've just covered. Three questions, what F is the location of Macduff's castle? What, would be, what word, beginning with T, does Lady Macduff use to describe her husband? And what W is a bird Lady Macduff uses to describe herself and her vulnerability in this scene? You can pause the video at this point, leave the answers as a comment below, and I'll happily answer every single person's comment. And now we're on to Act 4, Scene 3. This is the scene with Malcolm and Macduff. We are in England now, as obviously Malcolm has fled there. Malcolm starts by saying, let us seek out some desolate shade and there weep our sad bosoms empty. Notice the uses of words like desolate, weep, sad, how just absolutely devastated and depressing the scene is in Scotland at the minute, owing to Macduff's, um, Macbeth, sorry, his reign. We see here the, that Macduff continues this, how each new morn, new widows howl, new orphans cry, new sorrows strike heaven on the face. This repetition of new here is demonstrating Macbeth's reign of terror. Strike heaven on the face. Notice the natural world and heaven are both affected. Remember, Macbeth is not only king of Scotland, but king of the heavens as well. And in doing so, he is um, torturing both realms. Malcolm continues. and At this point, Malcolm begins to express his fears and doubts about being a, a, a proper fit king. Remember a term we covered in one of our earlier videos of kingship. The act of being a king, it's not just well and good to have a crown on your head, you have to be able to actually demonstrate why that is the point 
itself and why you are a good and goodly virtuous king. He says, this tyrant whose sole name blisters our tongues was once thought honest. You have loved him well. Malcolm is keen to reinforce here how they were both by, betrayed by him. People believed in Macbeth, them included. And Macbeth's an evil nature reinforced here. This tyrant, again referred to as a tyrant. His name blisters our tongues. This is really important there. Um, Malcolm continues and says, the good and virtuous nature may recoil in an imperial charge. He's saying, well, if I get the crown, I may not be a good and virtuous and king, one fit to rule over Scotland. Angels are bright still, though the brightest fell. He fears that as Macbeth fell, he will too. And he doubts that he has the innate human qualities and virtues to actually carry this off. Macduff then asks um, that he feels he's lost his hopes and he's worried that Malcolm won't continue. Malcolm continues and says, why in that rawness left you wife and child? He's confused as to why Macduff's sudden abandoning of his family has taken place. You know, why, why were they not there with him? Why has he done this on such a quick hour? Macduff then says, bleed, bleed, poor country. Scotland is personified here and suffering at the hands of Macbeth. Um, that it's bleeding. Notice it's not dying, but bleed like it's a slow leap, like it's something slow and suffering. I would not be the villain that thou thinkst, here Macduff is saying, for the whole space that's in the tyrant's grasp. He's reaffirming to Malcolm his virtues and his honour, that he would never ever be the one that's so traitorous as to do so. Malcolm then can, uh, says, asks him to be not offended, and he says, I think our country sinks beneath the yoke, it weeps, it bleeds. Notice that present tense, weeps, bleeds, and each day a new gash is added to her wounds. Notice this verbs, sinks, weeps, bleeds. They're demonstrating the continual suffering of Scotland. You know, it's not that it's happened, it is happening. And that's an important point to mention here, that Macbeth is slowly destroying the country of Scotland, and in doing so, the heavens. So, more suffer and more sundry ways than ever by him that shall succeed. This repetition of more and more, Malcolm fears that uh, the longer Macbeth continues to reign, the longer Scotland will suffer as a result. Continuing forward in the scene, Malcolm then says that he has a number of different vices, bad character flaws. It is in myself, I mean, in whom I know I all the particulars of vice so grafted. Black Macbeth will seem pure as snow compared to Malcolm. Malcolm fears that he is a much worse person than Macbeth, and granted Macbeth is bad, but he is far worse. You can that contrast of black and snow there for the different colours of purity and impurity. But Macduff is quick to say to him, not in the legions of horrid hell can come a devil more damned than evil to top Macbeth. Brilliant quote there about Macbeth and how bad he has become, how awful a ruler, a despot, a tyrant he has become to Scotland. Macduff is keen to realise here to Malcolm that he surely can't be as bad as Malcolm is. Malcolm then says, However, one of his greatest vices is his voluptuousness. Your wives, your daughters, your matrons and your maids could not fill up the cistern of my lust. He says here he's too lustful. He, he lusts for women too much. He fears that would be his undoing, that he has an innate character flaw that would not make him a good quality. He doesn't have the right human virtues of being a king. But Macduff is trying to say to him, fear not yet to take upon you what is yours. You may convey your pleasures in a spacious plenty. He's trying to make him realise this can be dealt with. This is something that can be managed and handled in a way that isn't the same with Macbeth right now. It's important to notice. As the scene continues, Malcolm says that's not just his only vice. He says, this, I, am, I, I have a staunchless avarice that, were I king, I should cut off the nobles for their lands, desire his jewels and his other's house. He says he's also not just a lustful person, but he is too greedy as well. He wants everything and he fears that he has these bad temperaments that will be his undoing and the further undoing of Scotland itself. Macduff then is trying to again persuade him that he's not all that bad by comparison. He says, Scotland have foisons to fill up your will of your mere own. All these are portable with other graces weighed. These are manageable. We can deal with this. This is nothing compared to the evils that Macbeth is enacting as the tyrannical despot. Scotland has plenty for Malcolm and it shouldn't be a problem and he shouldn't be afraid. Malcolm continues and says, I have none, the king becoming graces. I have no relish of them. He just says he lacks these kingly qualities, this idea of kingship, something you may have to be assessed on at some point. Uh, the idea of being a good and noble and virtuous king, it's just not him. He doesn't feel he has that in any way, shape or form. 
Malcolm's frustration, of sorry, Macduff's frustration boils over and he says, oh, Scotland, Scotland, the exclamation mark they're showing is anger and despair at this helplessness and the suffering of his country. However, as the scene con continues, Macduff reminds him, um, the nation miserable with an untitled tyrant, bloody sceptred, this idea of Scotland continuing to suffer, nation miserable, tyrant, bloody sceptred, and he reminds him, Thy royal father, Duncan, was a most sainted king, the queen that bore thee oftener upon her knees than on her feet. Malcolm reminds Macduff of his family's virtues. It's an important point there to notice. This is not just about um, Malcolm himself, but Malcolm's lineage. As the son of Duncan, who was a great king, he would almost certainly be one too, and he has to be mindful of that. And this persuades Malcolm, he says, Macduff, this noble passion, child of integrity, have from my soul wiped the black scruples, reconciled my thoughts to thy good truth and honour. He is persuaded by Macduff's passion and makes him realise that his flaws are not as large as they seem and they really are not um, the significant thing that he has initially made them out to be. He then says, I put myself to thy direction, that Macduff will govern him, again reinforcing Macduff's continuing and growing influence in the play and how he's becoming a much more significant figure as we are heading towards the play's end. Continuing here, a doctor enters, uh, now Malcolm is persuaded, and they comment on the King of England at this point, and the doctor says, at his touch, at the King of England's touch, such sanctity hath, given, hath heaven given his hand, and they, the ill, wretched souls mentioned earlier, presently amend. And sundry blessings hang about his throne that speaks him full of grace. Here Malcolm and the Doctor comment upon the holy qualities of the King of England, a direct contrast to Macbeth and his evil tyranny that he is ruling over the land, and how a king has to be holy. It's not just having a crown. It's what they're reinforcing here about Macbeth. It's not just that he has a crown. He has to be holy, saintly, virtuous. Good qualities must also be included with that. Continuing forward, the character of Ross enters. Remember, he was at the start of Act 4, Scene 2, and he's now here. Ross enters and says, Alas, poor country, almost afraid to know itself. Really wonderful quote coming up. It cannot be called our mother, but our grave. Ross reports on this idea of suffering, and notice this idea of contrast of mother and grave, like the motherland has become something buried and deserted and dying. Ross noticed that that of an hour's age doth hiss the speaker. Each minute teems a new grief. This idea of hiss and teems, verbs reinforcing the suffering and evil that are being done by Macbeth here, um, that he has had complete rule and grasp, a very continuous um, image that's being created over these two scenes. As we continue, Macduff asks, how does my wife? And Ross is very short in his responses. He says, why well? And his children are well too and they were all at peace when I did leave them. Notice Ross's awkwardness here. His lines demonstrate his fear of saying more, the brutal truth of the death of the Macduffs. He's keen to not mention this in any great way uh, because it's so important. Malcolm comments on how gracious England have lent us good Seward and 10,000 men. Malcolm's forces are being strengthened here by the characters in England. Uh, Seward is a character who has a, a slightly important role to play in Act 5, as you shall see in the coming videos. Ross then comes forward and says, I have words that would be howled out in the desert air where hearing should not latch them. He realises he has a devastating message to send and one he can't hide from any longer. At this point in the play, Ross then says how the main part pertains to you alone, to Macduff. The message is for Macduff. Now, Macduff as a person here is very straight up. He says, keep it not from me, quickly let me have it. He's unafraid of the bad news itself. He has to hear it. Let's have it out in the open. Ross is really afraid to say this, and then he comes towards it. Your castle is surprised, your wife and babes savagely slaughtered. The quarry of these murdered deer to add the death of you. Notice this idea of the brutal detail here. Ross doesn't pull back from giving out the actual details, whereas Macbeth previously hides details. You know, it's this idea of quarry, like a massive element of death, a huge pile of the dead, and deer, like the animal, reinforcing how vulnerable his entire family were and how they were butchered and completely cut apart by the forces of Macbeth. Malcolm reacts with shock, but Macduff's reaction is more um, slow to build. He says, my children too 
uh, Ross confirms, wife, children, servants, all that could be found. The line is entirely destroyed. Another question, my wife killed too? Ross confirms this. Malcolm tries to channel this in Macduff and says, Let, um, let's, make us medicines of our let's make us medicines of our great revenge to cure this deadly grief. Malcolm here urging Macduff to turn grief into action. Make sure you use this as a, as a way to channel yourself. However, Macduff at this point is very clear to make out how he has no children. All my pretty ones, did you say all? Oh, hell kite, all? What? And all my pretty chickens in their dam at one fell swoop? Macduff realizes he can never be truly revenged. You know, he can't, Macbeth has no family to wipe out. Macbeth has nothing he can take from him that is even adequate or equitable or equal to what Macduff has lost. Notice the punctuation here of question marks and exclamation marks, reinforcing the confusion and grief that Macduff is eminently feeling here and how broken he feels at this news. Malcolm asks him to dispute this like a man, and here's a really important quote from Macduff, particularly as we get towards Macbeth in Act 5, that I must also feel it as a man, and would not take their part. Sinful Macduff, they were all struck for thee, naught that I am. Notice how Macduff is really feeling this sense of grief and loss in a very human way, which is in direct contrast to how Macduff, um, excuse me, Macbeth will feel later on in Act 5, Scene 5, which we will cover in the coming videos. Really important point here. I must also feel it as a man, sinful Macduff, naught that I am. Malcolm encourages him, this, be this the whetstone of your sword, let this sharpen your sword, let grief convert to anger. Um, and Macduff promises that bring now this fiend of Scotland and myself within my sword's length to set him. If he scape, heaven forgive him too. Macbeth is ripe for shaking, Malcolm confirms, and they, he vows to personally defeat Macbeth. And at the reign of Macbeth will soon end as a result of Malcolm and more specifically Macduff and how his grief and how the grief he feels will turn to anger and revenge. So that concludes our video for today. Thank you as always for watching. Be sure to like, share and subscribe. Don't forget all the different platforms, Twitter, Instagram and TikTok. Don't forget to search Quiglet there. And until next time, take care, all the very best and bye bye.